Well, good morning, everybody, and a very warm welcome to you to our Cedars Church online service. As well as welcoming our church family, I also want to welcome any visitors that are joining us. It's been really encouraging to know that in recent weeks we've had people from up and down the country and indeed from other nations join us for these times. And so if that is you, welcome. We're so glad that you can join us and be part of our church family at this time. Let's begin this service by committing it to the Lord in prayer to ask him to bless our time together. Our Father in heaven, we come today to worship and adore you, to recognise that you are the living God. You are the one who created this world. You are the one who sustains this world. And you are the one who redeems this world. Lord, you sent your son, the Lord Jesus, to enter this fallen world on our behalf so that through his death and resurrection, we might find hope and new life. Lord, I pray that you would bless our service. I pray particularly for friends that are watching this, that are struggling at this time. I pray that you might draw near to them and encourage them as we fix our eyes on Jesus. And we ask, Lord, for all of us that as a result of this service, we might be more faithful in our commitment to following Christ. And we pray all these things in his great name. Amen. There's just a couple of quick announcements I want to give. The first is just to remind you that we are having online Zoom prayer meetings during this period. And so we've got them on Monday nights at eight o'clock and Friday mornings at 7.15 and then Sundays after church at 11.30. And so if you're able to join us for those, we would love for you to do so. You can find the information about them via the church emails. We're also having our home groups via Zoom. And so if you are part of one of those groups, you should have the information about that. But if you're part of our church and not part of a home group, then can I encourage you to, to think about joining one of those at this time? If you'd like to do that, then just get in touch by dropping us an email at info at cedarschurch.com and we will try and get you plugged into one of those groups. I also just wanted to mention junior church and youth church because I don't know about you watching this at home, but for me, I really miss seeing the kids and young people in our church. And I just wanted to take a moment to thank the leaders of those groups for the way that they've been providing great resources to our young people. They've been sending them out on Sunday mornings, giving them activities to do to help them in their spiritual journey. So huge thanks to those that are doing that. Now, in a moment, we are going to sing to our great God. But before we do that, I just want to read some verses to us from Psalm 57. My heart, O oh God, is steadfast. My heart is steadfast. I will sing and make music. Awake, my soul. Awake, harp and lyre. I will awaken the dawn. I will praise you, Lord, among the nations. I will sing of you among the peoples. For great is your love, reaching to the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the skies. Earlier on in this psalm, David speaks of the fact that he's in the presence of lions. He's in the midst of lions, which is pretty scary, isn't it? Now, some of us watching this might feel quite scared at this time and, and might be able to identify with David in the presence of lions. But David says, nonetheless, my heart is steadfast. His heart remains steadfast. Why? Because he knew that the love of God reaches to the heavens. And so we come today to celebrate the great love of God that goes on and on. No matter what our circumstances are, the love of God endures forever. And so we're now going to sing to this God. We're going to bless his holy name. So let's lift up our hearts and our voices in worship to him. Whatever man 
We're just going to pray and then read God's word. Uh, dear Lord, we thank you that we've just had Easter, Lord, that you rose again, defeating death, defeating sin. And we thank you just for the love you show us, um, for all you've done for us. And help us to focus on you at this um, strange time. Help us to be reading your word, praying to you, and um, to be focused on you. Help us to share the, the love and the light uh, that you bring. Um, help us to be witnesses in... Um, if we're still at work at our workplaces uh, via WhatsApp and text and things like that, Lord, just help us to, um, yeah, be shining lights for you in this, this very strange time. We thank you for um, our NHS, for uh, people on the front line working, Lord, uh, for those keeping our supermarkets full, for those looking after the elderly. Uh, there's so many people we can be thankful for and, um, yeah, praising at this time. Um, I, we pray for our government, Lord. Help them to be um, wise, to make the right decisions, to uh, stop this spread, Lord, but also, um, you know, balance poverty and, and how is the, all these things going to work. Uh, and I thank you that you're in control above them, Lord, that um, we don't have to worry about what our government's going to do, um, because we know that you're in control of, of all of this, Lord. Um, we also pray that... Um, You'd look after the vulnerable in our in our church, Lord. Um, uh, it's, it's, we 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 worry about um, the people that we know that are more vulnerable to this virus, Lord. But we pray that you'd you'd comfort them and comfort us and help us not to worry, and to and that you'd remind us that all things are in your hand, that you are in control, and that you are sovereign, Lord. Um, and I, just as Jonathan delivers uh, your word, Lord, we pray that um, our hearts would be open and, and welcome to, to hear your word, that we'd learn more of you and that you'd help him to uh, bring it wisely, Lord, and to say, uh, to bring what we need to hear from you, Lord. Amen. Our reading today is from Galatians chapter 5, verses 13 to 26. The words will come up on the screen. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. So I say, walk by the spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. Amen. Well, good morning again. I hope that you all had a very blessed Easter as you celebrated the good news that Jesus is alive. I hope that you enjoyed some chocolate too. Uh, there was definitely less chocolate in our household this year than other Easter's and so we're going to need to make up for that at some point. Uh, I hope you've been enjoying the weather. We've been so blessed, haven't we, to have such glorious weather which speaks to us of the goodness of God. 
And I hope that even in these unusual and difficult days, you have known the nearness of God, that God is with you, that he has not abandoned you, but he is walking right beside you. Now, if you cast your mind back to when we were meeting together, which feels like ages ago, at least it does for me, uh, you will remember that we were thinking about the book of Hebrews and working our way through it. Now, for various reasons, I've decided to put that series on hold. I do hope to pick it up and God willing, we will do that. But what I want to do for the next couple of months is think about the fruit of the Spirit. Now, the fruit of the Spirit is a list of nine character traits that the Apostle Paul provides for us in Galatians 5. These are character traits that God wants to form in us. You see, when we are saved, when we are brought to God through Jesus, God places his spirit inside of us and his desire is to change us so that we become more and more like Jesus, so that the character of Christ is formed in us. And Paul talks about this transformation as fruit. He uses the image of fruit, just as a, a healthy fruit tree is shown to be a healthy fruit tree by the fruit it produces. So we as Christians are shown to be healthy, Jesus-loving Christians when we demonstrate the fruit of the Spirit. And the fruit of the Spirit is this, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. Now what we're going to do over the next nine weeks is think about one of those each week. And so today we are thinking about love, the fact that God wants us to demonstrate love. Now normally we are going to just launch straight in and think about the character trait for the day. But today I want to give some background to this text. Because like all of scripture, these verses from Galatians 5 come in a context. And it's important for us to know that context to really grasp what Paul is trying to teach us. Now, Paul was a man who, prior to being a Christian, despised Christians. He, he persecuted them. But once he encountered the risen Jesus, he was a man on a mission. He wanted to proclaim the good news of Jesus to as many people as he could. His message was this, that God has rescued people through the work of Jesus, that Jesus is our substitute and all we need to do to be accepted by God is to embrace Jesus, to be sorry for our sin and recognise that Jesus is all that we need. And so Paul went around preaching that message, including to a place called Galatia, which was in Asia Minor, which is modern day Turkey. And Paul preached that message of grace there and there was great response. And Paul was understandably encouraged by that. And so when Paul left them, he had reason to rejoice in what God had done there in Galatia. But while he was away, he heard some things that disturbed him. And so he writes this letter of Galatians to them to address the things that he's worried about. And in the letter, he basically says this. You started so well. You were on the right course. Everything was going well. But now some people have come in and cut in on you. Who are these people and what are they saying? Well, these are Judaizers, Jewish legalists who are saying Christ isn't actually enough. If you really want to be accepted by God, then you don't just need Christ, but you also need to follow certain Jewish laws like circumcision and food laws and things like that. You see, in the Old Testament, God chose the Jewish people and he gave them laws, some of which were just meant to be temporary. They were just meant to mark the Jewish people out as separate from the world. But in the New Covenant, those laws don't apply and they shouldn't have ever been placed on Gentile people, on non-Jewish people. But these Judaizers, these Jewish legalists were coming in saying, if you really want God to accept you, you need to do things like circumcision. And Paul wants to say, no, it's just about Christ. Christ is enough. You don't need to follow a bunch of rules to be accepted by God. You just need to put all your hope in Jesus. If you put your hope in rules, you are putting yourself under a yoke of slavery. Christ has redeemed us from slavery. We are free, people of the Spirit. Don't put yourselves under slavery by doing things like circumcision. And so we read this in verse 6. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. 
In other words, don't listen to those who have cut in on you saying that you need to be circumcised. What you need is to carry on as you were at the beginning, putting all your hope in Jesus and showing that you have this faith in Jesus by the way you love one another. So there's a freedom in Jesus. We don't follow him by following a bunch of rules. We, we have trust in him and we have this liberty of the spirit. Now that liberty, that freedom doesn't result, or at least it shouldn't, in a kind of license to do whatever we want. You see, as well as rejecting legalism, Paul makes it clear that when you follow Christ, you won't just give in to all your selfish desires. Now, Paul's very clear that we have those selfish desires. He talks in Galatians 5 a lot about the flesh. Within us, each one of us, there is this sinful nature. We have it from birth where we are so prone towards self-centeredness and desiring to fulfill and gratify our own desires. Paul says we have this flesh and it remains with us. Now, there have been Christians who have taught that you can get to a state of perfection, even here on earth, but the Bible doesn't teach that. We won't reach perfection until we reach glory when we're with Christ in heaven. The uh, 19th century preacher, Charles Spurgeon, once heard a man speak about perfectionism, and that man claimed that he'd reached perfectionism. And later on, when that man wasn't looking, Spurgeon came and poured milk over the man's head, and the man became very angry, and Spurgeon was then able to make the point, my friend, I don't think you've reached the state of perfection. None of us reach the state of perfection. We have this war going on as Christians between the flesh, which is our sinful nature, and the spirit. They're combating each other like two aggressive dogs. And so look with me at verses 17 and 18 and see what Paul says there. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Paul then goes on to talk about what it looks like if we live according to the flesh. And he says, we've got this battle, we've got this sinful nature that goes against the spirit. So you've got this combat going on between the flesh and the spirit. And God wants to form character in you, the character of Christ. And that doesn't come by a list of rules. It comes by the power and work of his spirit. And it comes by us keeping our eyes on the Lord Jesus. So let's look now at that list that he gives for us in Galatians 5 verses 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. Against such things there is no law. As we said earlier, he uses the metaphor of fruit. A, a, a tree doesn't bear fruit because it's obeying commands, does it? It obeys, it, it, it bears fruit because there's life in it. There's, there's water that feeds the roots and there's sap that flows throughout the tree. Law can't change us, but the spirit can. You see, legalism has this outward display of religiosity that kind of might be change our behaviour, but it doesn't really change our hearts. It's not real fruit. It's kind of like plastic fruit. When we decorate our Christmas tree, we have some plastic berries that go on it. And one time we had a, some friends over and one of their little ones crawled along and put those berries in her mouth. And she soon discovered that that was not real fruit. And so she spat it out. That is a little bit like religious legalism. It looks OK on the outside for a while, but sooner or later we'll see that it's not authentic. It's not real change. It's just outward behavioural modification, but it's not a transformed heart. But God wants to transform our hearts by the power and enabling of his Holy Spirit. Now notice it talks about the fruit of the Spirit, not fruits. It's a singular thing, the fruit of the Spirit. Now elsewhere in the Bible we read about the gifts of the Spirit, and we read there that one has this gift, maybe teaching and preaching, another has this gift, perhaps administration, but with the fruit of the Spirit, it's different. We're not called to say, well, my fruit is kindness. I'm kind. I'm not faithful, but I'm kind. No, no, we can't say that. The fruit of the Spirit comes as a package. God wants all of these traits to flow 
from us to, to, to demonstrate that we are Christ's. We are called to demonstrate all of these. And so he uses the term in the singular, the fruit of the spirit. A spirit filled person should display all of these things. And as I said, today we're thinking about love and love really is the basis for all of the fruit. That's why we saw in Galatians 5, 6, Paul say these words, the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. Love is the foundation for all of the Spirit's work. So what is love? What is love? As I, I say those words, maybe a quote comes to your mind or a pop song or something like that. What is love? Now that is a huge question, isn't it? What is love? It's a question that if we were to go out on the streets and ask people to survey them, then everybody would have some kind of answer to that question. And probably for many of them, their views are informed by Hollywood. They, they've got this kind of romantic, emotional view of love that climaxes in that great kiss that comes at the end of every movie. And so often in Hollywood, you see the kiss at the end of the movie and it stops. You don't get to see love as it really is which is costly and sacrificial. And the Bible makes it clear that true love is not just romantic and emotional. It is costly. It is sacrificial. Now, of course, there's a place for emotion. But first and foremost, love is a choice. It's a, an act of our will. We choose to love. That's what we're called to. Now, the Bible of course, talks extensively about love. And so in this short time that we've got, we're just scratching at the surface, really. And in order to help us see something of what the Bible says about love, what I want to do is, is focus on some verses that speak about love from elsewhere in the Bible. So that's what I'll do in every one of these series. I'll pick some verses that speak on the particular character trait of the day. And today we're thinking about love. And I want to read some words from 1 John 4 verses 7 to 12. 1 John 4, 7 to 12. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. Now this morning I want to bring out three things from this text and they are three very simple things so I hope they'll be easy to remember. Uh, the first two are shorter than the last one and the last one really is uh, the one that's most connected to the fruit of the spirit to do with us demonstrating love. But the first two really are the foundation for love. We need to know the first two if we are to demonstrate love in our lives. And the first thing I want us to think about is the fact that God is love. God is love. And that's based on verses seven to eight. We read those famous words, God is love, at the end of verse eight. Those words are, are, are well known. We find them graffitied on walls in various places. Even footballers might have them stitched in their boots or something like that. Uh, at, at our wedding, we had them in big letters at the front of the church. God is love. These words are saying that God in his very nature, in his very essence, is love. God has always existed as a loving Father, as, as, as a trinity of love. You see, the trinity is the basis for this. Even before the world was made, God was a community of love, Father, Son and Spirit. There's this reciprocal love that exists between the Father, the Son and the Spirit. We see that so clearly when Jesus came to earth. You see the great intimacy and love that exists between the Father and Son. We see it perhaps supremely at his baptism. When Jesus was baptised, what did the Father say? This is my son whom I love. 
with him I am well pleased. And at that point, the spirit descended on Jesus as a dove. It's a community of love. And this loving God made this world that we live in as an extension of his love. He did it to demonstrate his glory, but he did it out of love. It wasn't because he lacked anything, but out of love and out of a desire to display his glory, he made this world and he made us to be people who love. God placed within us the capacity to love. That's why it says in verse 7, love comes from God. You and I, friends, were made with the capacity to love because God is love and love comes from God. And when God made human beings in his image and likeness and gave us the capacity to love, our, our calling was to love him and to love one another. Now, sadly, in the Garden of Eden, that love for God and love for each other was turned in on itself as Adam and Eve chose love for self over love for God and others. And we inherit that nature, that nature that is so prone to loving ourselves over loving God and loving other people. That is what we said earlier, Paul calls the flesh. We love self more than God and others in our natural state. But even though we turned our backs on God, God didn't stop loving. He still loved people in great love. He, he sent Jesus. You see, God's love doesn't run dry. And even when we were lost in sin, God showed love to us. And that is my second point today. God shows love. God shows love. And here we're looking at verses 9 and 10. Let's read them again. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. God shows us his love. He sent his son into the world to bring us back to him. His son was given as a sacrifice, a loving sacrifice. Friends, God showed love. That is so important because love is sacrificial. It's costly and God has shown that himself in giving his only son. And although, as we'll see, the fruit of the Spirit is primarily concerned with our calling to love each other, we need to see that this love of Jesus dying in our place is the foundation for us to love other people. We need to see, first of all, that our love is actually tiny compared to the love that God has poured out on us. Because we had nothing to commend ourselves to God to gain this love. We are we were his enemies. Christ died for us when we were his enemies. The Father sent the Son because the Father loves us. And the Son wasn't sent against his own will. The Son laid down his life for us. And so we read in the chapter before these verses we're looking at, in 1 John 3, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. He laid down his life for us. That is how we know what love is. Friends, if we want to grow in love, we need to, first of all, enjoy and drink in this love of God that was given to us. This is the fuel for the Holy Spirit to use in us to create love in our hearts. 1 John 3 begins with these words. See what great love the Father has lavished on us that we might be called children of God. The Father has lavished love on us. We need to be in awe of that love. We need to drink in that love every day to fix our eyes on the astonishing love of God. We are living in difficult days and many people are asking the questions, how can a loving God allow such things to happen? Now, I don't have the answers to that question. I don't have all the answers, at least. But one thing I know is that God is loving because a God who sent his son to die in my place when I was so unworthy, has proved that he's a God of love. So I don't have the answer to why God allows this coronavirus to go on. I, I struggle as I read reports of people losing loved ones. I'm sure we all do. We see the news, we're so demoralised, and at times it can be hard to see God's goodness. 
But friends, when we feel like that, we need to stop and we need to fix our eyes on the love that Jesus showed for us at the cross. So that no matter what's going on in our lives, we might be able to declare those words that we sang earlier on. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. How marvellous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvellous, how wonderful is my Saviour's love for me. Friends, we need to be in awe of the gospel. And when we are in awe of the gospel, the Holy Spirit of God will start to cultivate love in our hearts. Love for him and love for each other. Which leads me to my final point today, which is this. We must love. We must love. This is verses 11 and 12. Let me read verse 11 to us. Dear friends, since God loved us, we also ought to love one another. You see, friends, the cross of Jesus is our hope for salvation, but it's also our model. Since he loved, we too must love. And as we've said, the Bible's definition of love is so different from the world around us, from the one proclaimed in Hollywood. It's primarily a choice, not a feeling. We are called to love. We are commanded to love, to demonstrate love for each other by caring for people, by encouraging people, by serving people, by blessing people, by forgiving people. We are called to demonstrate love in a way that may be sacrificial to us. And who are we called to love? We're called to love one another. There's no specifics here. We're called to love everybody. Now, of course, we're going to warm to some people more. We're going to spend more time with some than others. But friends, we're called to love all those that we come into contact with, even those that we struggle with. You know, we read in Luke 10 how Jesus is talking with a man about love and he's talking about the great commandments. The two great commandments are this, to love God and to love your neighbour. And the man says to him, well, who is my neighbour? And it's at that point that Jesus tells the parable of the Good Samaritan. That parable is probably well known to us. It involves uh, this man who was injured being left on a road and the two religious people who you would have thought would be the ones to help just walk on by but a Samaritan helps him. Now Samaritans and Jews were enemies and so this was to teach that we are called to love even those that we would naturally not click with, those that we would naturally keep a distance from. Jesus wants us to show love indiscriminately. We are called to love all those around us. Now that's hard. That is not easy. If we're honest, we do not find that easy, do we? Because there are, as I said, some people that we click with more than others. And there are some people that have really hurt us. And it can be so hard to love them and perhaps forgive them for wrong that they've done. So how do we do that? Well, friends, I said earlier on that these, the first two points in my sermon are the foundation. And they really are. We need to constantly remind ourselves that God is love. That was the first point. God is love. Love comes from him. And so we need to recognise he is the source of all love. We do not naturally have the capacity to love as God calls us to. And so when we are struggling to love, we need to come to him in prayer. We need to ask him and say, Lord, I need your spirit to help me to love. You are the source of love. Will you help me love those around me? And then we need to remember the second point, that Christ showed love. God showed love through the person of Christ. If we look at the cross, we'll see how unworthy we were and how much love was lavished on us. And as we see that, the Spirit of God has something to, to work in us, to show us, look, this is what you've been, the love you've been given. You are called now to resemble that love to those around you, even those that you find hard to love. Friends, this might be costly, but it's, it's the path to true life. It really is the path to true life. I mentioned earlier on that when God made human beings, he made them to love him and to love each other, but that we turned in on ourselves. Friends, the Spirit of God has restored us to God and he wants us now to live as we were first created to, which is to love God and to love those around us to love God and to love those around us. And at this point, 
I want to thank you as a church for the way that you have responded during this coronavirus period by the love that is shown within the fellowship has been really moving. The way that you've served one another, you've called one another, you've prayed for one another is such an example of Christ-like love and the Spirit's work. So thank you so much for that. And friends, this love amongst ourselves that God wants to continue to cultivate will be a real witness to the world around us. When God's people live in the way that he intends and demonstrates love, it, it, it displays the love for others to see. Look with me at verse 12. It says this, No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. Do you see those words there? That no one has ever seen God. God is invisible. Now, there are people in the Old Testament who had glimpses of him, and then Jesus comes along and reveals him. Jesus is God who walks among us. But people can't naturally see God. But what God wants to do is use us to display his love. It's, it's almost like we are this these people who seem so small, but God wants to use us to show a tiny fraction of the invisible God. We are seeking to make the invisible God visible through the love that we show. Friends, when we live as a people of love, it has a massive impact upon our witness. You see, yes, we have a message to proclaim, but that message, uh, the door for that message is open so much when we love one another and we make the invisible God more visible. When I did those uh, Holy Week devotions, I talked about Maundy Thursday and how the word Maundy comes from the word mandatum, which is that Christ gave us a command. Mandatum means command. What was that command? He says this, a new commandment I give you that you love one another as I have loved you. And then what does he say after that? By this will all men know that you are my disciples. It's when we love one another that we show that we are Christ's disciples. And so friends, as I come to a close, I just wanna say, let's grow in this. And so as we enter a new week, let's seek to become people who demonstrate this love. Now to do that, we need to spend time with our God, reading his word and praying. If you don't have a Bible reading pattern, then can I encourage you in the next week to read through the letters of 1 John. We've looked at 1 John 4 today, but there's three letters of, of, that John wrote and there's seven chapters in total so read um, one chapter a day there's uh, five chapters in, in 1 John and then just one chapter in, in 2nd and 3rd John read those chapters those books because they speak so much about love and ask the Spirit of God to place his love in your hearts as you read them and as well as spending time with the Lord think of practical ways that you can show love to others to your spouse to your kids, to your colleagues, to your neighbours. Do something practical that shows love to those around you. That might be a text message to somebody or, or a card encouraging somebody. Words of encouragement speak so much to our souls. We need encouragement. This week, think about people that you can encourage. Get in contact with them. Encourage them and bless them. Show love to them. Or maybe that will come through a phone call where you phone up somebody and just ask, can I pray for you? We're living in a time where people are feeling lonely. Pick up that phone, give them a call, ask them how they can, you can pray for them. Perhaps it will mean spending time with your, your spouse, maybe cooking for them or doing something practical like that, or spending time just playing with your children. We live in a time where we're probably spending a lot of time in our homes, but even then we can be ignorant of, of those that we're living with. Let's spend time showing those in our family, those that we live with, that we love them, that they are a blessing to us and we care about them. Perhaps you could show love by reaching out to a neighbour. As you know, most of you, I, I created some cards that you can put through a neighbour's door just saying that you're willing to help them or pray for them in, in a way uh, if they need help and so if you have neighbours that you think might gain from that then I encourage you to do that. If you get in touch with me I can send those cards to you, you can just print them off, stick them through the door and be a blessing to your neighbour. Or perhaps friends you need to show love by forgiving somebody. That is perhaps the most costly love and it's the one that resembles what Jesus did for us on the cross where he died in our place 
and said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Let's show forgiveness. And friends, as we do all these things, as we seek to grow in love, let's remember those first two points, that God is love. In his very nature, he is love. Love comes from him. We need to ask him, Lord, give me love in my heart for those around me. And as you do that, fix your eyes on the fact that God showed love. That was our second thing. God showed love in the person of Jesus. He has shown his love. He has demonstrated it. That while we were far from him, Christ died for us and brought us back to the Father. And he calls us now to show that love to the world around us. And as we love one another, we demonstrate something of the love of the invisible God. We make the, the love of this invisible God visible in our world. And we bring light and hope to this dark world. May the Spirit of God enable us to live in this way, to become a Spirit-filled people who demonstrate love. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we come before you and we recognise that you are the great God of love and love comes from you. Lord, what a, an awesome thing to worship a God who is not only powerful, powerful, but is deeply loving and has shown us great love in Jesus. You have demonstrated your love. You have proved your love by sending your son for us. And our prayer is that we might show love to others too, that we might demonstrate the love that you have given to us. Lord, may we be your hands and feet, your light in this dark world. And we pray all these things in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. At the beginning of this message, I said how the Galatian church started so well because they put all their hope in Christ. Friends, that's what we are called to do, put all our hope in Christ. And we're going to sing a song now that speaks of that. Christ alone, cornerstone. Let's sing together. shall come 
with trumpet sound. Oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone. Faultless I stand before the throne. Christ Well, friends, that is the end of our service. I'm so glad that you could join us today. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. <laughs>